Hello, everyone, and welcome to this event of the Java User Group Switzerland in collaboration with our friends from the Software Crafts Romandie mm. community. My name is Peti Koch, and I am one of your hosts today. The other host today is Alexander Guva, and it's a pleasure to have Victor Rentea with us here today. Hi. How are you guys? Everything fine so far? Yeah, clear, yes. yes. Okay, so before we start, I have a couple of slides with some general information. Um, first, thanks to all the sponsors for their support. Then for you as participants, there's the possibility to use the chat. There's a tab uh, on the right side. Maybe you can write in, where are you from? I'm from Lucerne, for example. And then if you have a question, uh, there's a question and answers tab. Just type in your question there. We will pick it up and try to answer it. To get in touch with the Java user group, Switzerland community, you can use the Slack workspace. You find the URL here on the slide, or you can use the QR codes. If you want to get in touch with the Software Crafts Romandie community, there's the meetup page. And uh, it's a pleasure now for me to uh, give the word to Alexander to tell a few words okay. uh, about your community. Okay, thank you, Pete. Uh, so yeah, hello to everyone. So the Sotra Craft Romanian community, it's, uh, let's say we have something like one or two years, uh, yeah, two years life, but we were turned out, turned off uh, during the COVID for all 20 and we come out. Uh, we started with com uh, some events. We have every two weeks an event event in French or in English. Uh, and every time there's an event in English, at the same time it's shared with the Java user group. Uh, next event, um, it will be the 16th of, um, of March with uh, Nicolas Frankel. We present a subject around the tests. And the 30th of March, we join again Betty with the Java user group with um, uh, Alex Bol Bolboaca. Bolboaca. <laughs> Yeah, something like that. <laughs> Someone great. I met him a um, few years ago in uh, in London. Uh, I'm sure you're gonna love it, and he's gonna present a good job, a good subject. And then we have many other speakers coming uh, already for this semester and uh, next semester, like this. And hopefully next uh, after summer we can have uh, on-site event too, like this. Okay, I give you back. Uh, the microphone. Thank you, Alexander. Sounds great. Then uh, there's uh, there are YouTube channels from both of our communities. Uh, you can subscribe to them. If you click mm -hmm. the bell, you will get not notified about new videos. Today, this uh, talk is uh, a new talk from Victor, and we will not publish it publicly. But if you ask us, we will share the link with you. Maybe if you want to share it with a, a friend at your company or so. So no problem. It will show up sometimes uh, later uh, on, on the public uh, channel. So that's the image. Same thing for us in, uh, for the, job, the, the craft community. So it will be not public for us too. And uh, we will share the link to uh, to the community uh, uh, person that wish to have the video, and it will be public somewhere uh, during the year. I don't know exactly when. Thank you. Okay, then uh, after the talk uh, in in this big marker uh, webinar platform, you will all be redirected to a session from Wonder Wonder dot me. Um, this is a very interesting virtual space where you can move around freely and you can build your small little uh, groups where you can just chat with each other in this small little group. 
And then if you want, you move to another group, talk to some uh, other person like uh, in the real uh, world. So feel free to join us and have a chat with us and of course with each other of us if you want. Then as uh, Alexander already said, there will be more events coming soon for the Java user groups Switzerland. Just use the mailing list form on the web page and from the, for the Software Crafts Romandi community, just uh, sign up to the meetup group and you will get the email notification for upcoming events. So that's all from my side. And it's a pleasure now to give the word to Victor. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, can you share? Yes, the screen. Thank you. So you should be able to see the screen. Let me just one second. I must explain a bit why the videos are not public because I'm planning to run these on some conferences at some point, and this time of the year they get very. They don't want the video to be published. I mean, we lack the human presence. So, what's the difference between a recorded video and a conference talk, really? So that's a new topic for you today. Um, something is not yet published anywhere. Uh, refactoring blockers and code smells. Let's uh, just quick introduction about me. My name is Victor Enta. I'm a Java champion. Uh, I love simple design refactoring and unit testing. That's why I founded the Bucharest Software Craftsmanship Community in the same um, in the same uh, style, let's say, like Alexander did. It's the same goal. Uh, the community here is uh, 2,000 and something people, 2,300 people. Uh, yeah, I am young in my profile picture. <laughs> I know, I'm older now. Um, so in this community, I ran more than 100 events myself, talking about refactoring, about TDD, and about other stuff like that. I have a website with a blog, talks, and many other goodies. And right now, what I'm doing for a living, I'm just doing training and consultancy, or in recently also coaching for uh, interested persons. Um, the topics that I teach are, of course, coming from the Java world, most of them, Spring Hibernate Functional Programming and Performance. But my most wanted topics have nothing to do with Java. Like design patterns, domain-driven design, clean code, unit testing. This I can do in many languages, including reactive programming. Um, and that's what I'm doing for the past eight years. Hundreds of teams, thousands of people. And I wanted to share with you some some of the things I, I, I learned by discussing clean code and refactoring with hundreds of teams. Um, yeah, that's my website again. And in case you want to contact me, the best way is on Twitter. I'm most responsive there. Also on LinkedIn works very okay for me. Right. So if you have any other question, if you watch this online or offline, the thing that you didn't manage to ask me, just uh, contact me and uh, we can discuss afterwards. So to answer Marco, I think I was 25. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just send that to get that answer out of that. Good. So, um, Code Smells, so, cool quoting from the refactoring book. If it stinks, you should change it. The grandma of, uh, of uh, Kent Beck used to say that. So, Code Smells. So let's start with the most. I won't go into all the Code Smells, but I will try to cover those which are most common in Java and in, in, uh, in, um, in the projects that you are building today. Right. First of all, a large method. Big method. Now, uh, if, it depends on the project, but typically a method which is larger than 20 lines kind of stinks, you know? You have to break it down. Now, to be completely precise, uh, uh, the more complex a method is, the shorter should be. So the, if you want to get a number, 20 lines comes from a way, 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 uh, for a long time ago, remember? If you ask, however, Uncle Bob, he will say that five lines should be a line or a method, or even shorter than five lines. However, the reasonable idea is to keep it smaller than a screen. But when I say that, I don't mean you should rotate your monitor. I mean a screen like in the old days, 20 lines of code, right? It's not just a measuring of the in the ASCII uh, uh, screen, but it's actually the amount of things that, that, that fit in a human's mind easily, right? And uh, again, the more complex is a function, then the smaller it should be. Quoting the Linux style guide, the max length is inversely proportional to the complexity. In other words, if a method is difficult to understand, break it. Right? If it takes more than several seconds to understand what happens there, break it. Don't, don't think much about that. Break it into smaller ones. A good class, a class which is more than 200 or 300 lines, clearly is smelly. 
It's hard to understand. You are terrified to use it. It's bad. Too many parameters. More than four starts to become strange. Uh, and typically, if it's, I don't know, six or seven, it's typically there's a class in there somewhere that you have to find. And data clumps are chunks of data that moves through your system together. So imagine there you always find two strings and a long moving through many methods in your system. Then that might be a... Uh, thing that you didn't discover yet. That might be an address value object that you need to introduce in your design to make it more, more, more expressive and more, more short in the, same, in the same time. So these are the things which are very, very, very frequent, yeah, especially in legacy code, huge methods, huge classes, but this too happen in new projects also, right? So I want you to, be, to, be, to keep a close look, a close eye on any time there is a bunch of data moving together through your system. And then you create a class. And your data, your classes will by default have this getter setter mania, right? We all cried. I mean, I was called once to help some uh, developers pass the client, the final client interview for a consulting company. And that final client, that company that was supposed to actually put those guys to, to work, rejected those candidates. And the thing that had in common all those rejections were was the fact that they were blindly generated getting getters and setters. They were blindly just generating getters and setters. That, that's bad. You should try always to keep more logic inside those data classes. Uh, one way to figure what should go in is another code smell called feature envy. A feature envy is when a method works heavily with the state of another method. Um, and then you need to ask yourself if you are, if you use seven of those fields, don't you better fit inside that class rather than accessing all those fields from outside? So feature envy is a way to detect when there is logic that should fit better inside that class from an object-oriented perspective, if you want to put it like that. Primitive, primitive, primitive obsession is a code smell, but it's a more extreme sign of how to put this. Uh, many people won't think it's bad to pass a long or a string from there to there. But other people, especially after they read something about domain-driven design, they start create, they will start creating a phone number instead of a string. A little class phone number containing just a single string. Passing that phone number around so you can get you get more semantic. It's not just a string, it's just a phone number. They, they also look very nice in the maps. If you put a phone number as a value in a map, it's obvious what it is. If it were just a string, <laughs> God help you all, yeah. remembering what that string meant. Order ID is another extreme form in which you don't pass a long round uh, so that you don't ask yourself, what was that long again? No, no, you pass an order ID and you keep this as a primary key, basically, in your entity if you're using Hibernate. You can do this, but it's more extreme. Uh, uh, it's, um, I mean, some projects would do that, not all. Then middleman. There's another code smell, which is the actually the opposite. If you just create a method inside a, a class, which does not, doesn't do anything, that, then just delegate into another method with the same name. Mind, it's the same freaking name. If you are delegating to the same name, it doesn't really have to be there. You can you could directly navigate the bio and get age. Some of you might remember that uh, something about uh, the law of the matter. And it actually referred to this in the, the in the in the book, in the refactoring book. And they will likely they will like it to if more if it were called the occasionally useful suggestion of the matter. So you see, Martin Farrer and Ken Beck kind of demit uh, how to put this, uh, uh, um, reduced the power of the law of the matter. You might have heard of that. If you didn't heard of it, never mind. But the point is. Don't be afraid to traverse the model uh, in case uh, you don't have anything to hide. Really. Oh, and here comes the best one. Yeah, the um, normally I would like to to uh, to ask you folks if you've ever created some code um, for some feature that you anticipate that will come at some point, right? And um, if I ask that, typically maybe 10 or 20% of you, more probably those more experienced of you would raise your hand and say, yeah, I did that. And then did you, did you delete that code six months after? <laughs> probably you did. So it's called speculative generality. The idea of putting something in place for a feature that you think will come to you. 
right? And this clearly goes against the, the, the KISS principle, keep it short and simple. Uh, your question I get, are Uncle Bob's opinions to large methods five or 20 lines sacrosanct? No. Is this rule backed by any objective means? Very good question. Of course, always challenge the things that you hear. Now, my, my heuristic, if you ask me, is if I run into a, if I run into a function, let me just, if that I don't understand in three to five seconds, if I don't get what that function does in five seconds, I always break that function. This is my heuristic. Most developers I see that they assimilate well without any confusion and methods around 10 lines of code. It's clear for everyone. 20, most of them, right? But a function that you need to scroll two times to see the entire function probably will uh, not be as clearly understood like a shorter one. There are times in which you will create, I, I will create methods of a single line of code if I want to express a very clear semantic in there. Yeah, I would create half a line. Like is, for example, is active that returns boolean, which just um, returns uh, return uh, status equals equals uh, active. Useful for Java 8 feature filtering, just a one liner method in my entities. I, I do that because I want my, I want to be expressive code, right? Try to expressive code. So don't, no, it's not a, something you like a religion, no, but your, your, your sense, I mean, if you are in a, in, a, in a team, which is very experienced with legacy code, maybe you can live with functions more than 20 lines, suit yourself. But the more, most, most people that join our profession are comfortable with around 20 lines at maximum. I, I am sure about that. I've talked to thousands of developers. I know what people understand. Primitive obsession type alias, I don't know that answer. I will just read in the after I finish. Now, have, do you remember the game that we used to play when we, we, we were little? The parents gave us um, these two images and asked us to find all the differences. It's, it's brilliant. It's uh, like, wow, what, why did they do that? Because they wanted us out uh, uh, off their head for several minutes. They wanted peace. For a, for, a, for a moment, right? So they put they put us to find all the differences. Now, can you imagine these are two copy pasted bits of code, <laughs> which just happen to be different in this part? And you ask yourself the one million dollar question: Is it a bug or a feature? This is the definition of legacy when you don't know if the copy pasted code is supposed to be different or not, right? This is why duplicated code is bad. Copy pasting code in itself is not bad if you don't change the copy. And so basically, you probably knew about the uh, the dry principle. Don't repeat yourself. Right? You shouldn't copy paste your own logic. But it's somehow interesting, subtle, because it's more dramatic when you copy paste code which implements business requirements. Why? Because business requirements change out of your control. But it's not the end of the world if you copy paste a class which is named string utils. Okay. Copy pasting string utils from here to there is not a big deal because yeah, the string utils will pretty much be the same. The requirements that you get to that technical class are very technical. They don't change because of the business analyst said so. So basically it's, it's dramatic when you copy paste business rule implementation. It's not a problem to copy paste some sequence of method invocations or some technical means of computing some utility function. But it becomes a problem when these change because business wants to. A symptom of that is what we call shotgun surgery, another code smell. By the way, all those code smells I'm not making up myself. They are in this book, the chapter three. Right? They all, they're all here if you, are re if you want to read more. And actually, th that's the best way to read this book, which is quite a boring book. But if you start with chapter three and you identify the things that you recognize from your code base that annoy you, you can then read a full set of possible options. For example, long parameter list, introduce parameter object. This is the best way to read this book, starting with chapter three. I'm talking about the refactoring second edition, 2018, December, Martin Farrell came back. Very, very good book in this regard. So shotgun surgery is a symptom of copy-pasting code. Whenever you have to do a change, you end, your, you end up doing that change in many, many classes. If this happens very, very, very frequently, probably you need to group these things together in a single thing, let's say, right? Good, now, this is uh, the, the opposite of that. Yes, indeed, Marco, they are very good. So ideally, you can always break down a method into its sub-methods, giving semantics to the whole construct. Yes, you should decompose a method into smaller steps, naming those steps with nice, significant, and uh, semantic-rich method names. Not, not like this. Sorry, not like M, for example. Not like this. 
But what I wanted to point out here is that the opposite of, of if you refuse to copy paste code, completely re reject that, you will end up in the following case. You have a method which has a client, and this client is a friend of yours, right? And, and he asks you a favor, so to do something from him, specifically for him. So what you do, you add an if probably here. Then another client of yours comes and asks you to do one more thing just for him. Because you want to suit everyone, to make everyone happy, what do you do? You put some more code in M to suit their needs too. And here, this happens over and over again. What you end up is the famous Boolean parameter in those methods, which, have, which wants to, 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 to suit the needs of many clients. What I want to point out here is that at some point you do need to copy paste some part of M to break M into chunks, into separate things and not mix responsibilities together. So if you, if you look at it, you are violating single responsibility principle if you are trying to, to, to fulfill many requirements from the same methods. This is so basically it is more single responsibility principle if you break M in four. Maybe you could be pasting just a bit of that. On the other hand, it's more uh, dry to not do that and to stick, maybe to even put a boolean. I mean, if you, if you are very, very against copy pasting code, you will end up adding booleans to your code. So this is why famously dry and SRP sometimes come in conflict. SRP will push you towards making completely separated code bases, will push you to microservices if you want to, to say that, where dry will, 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 will tell you to keep things coupled together and to have a single representation of that, that logic, to have a central point, not copy pasting anything. Switch. What's wrong with switch? <laughs> you would ask, what's wrong with switch? What? We learned it in high school. What the heck? What's wrong with switch? I think it's wrong with switch. But what it's wrong when the switch repeats in many places. The problem is that when you add a case in one switch, you need to, to remember to add the case in many uh, in other places. Now, if you ask Uncle Bob about this, he will probably say to you that you need to use polymorphism for that. You have a class with one method, two method, three methods, and another implementation of that same interface implementing these three, and another implementation implementing these three. Like an interface with three implementations, basically. Yeah, but uh, you know, Uncle Bob is the founder of Object Mentor. So of course he will say that. He's an object-oriented guy, right? down to his bones. Now, in, in Java, uh, in Java uh, 15, but basically 17, you get your hands on. You we do can we do we can do return switch. You know we have this switch expressions that are added to the language. You can do return switch, and that return switch if you switch on an enum, I, I should prove, should I prove this to you? Yeah, it's very easy. So I have an enum a with the value x y, and then you have this. Uh, let's put a method here method method, and then. I just want to point out if if I am on uh, Java 50, um, let me just uncomment this, right? And comment this out, right? And delete this, right? Maven import, and of course the thing here, Java 15, Java 15 preview, that's it. Now, if you are on Java 15, and you have to return an integer here, and if you switch on uh, an, uh, an A, an enum, if you can do return switch, switch, switching on A, in which case, in which case, in which case, you can then just do case X. But now let me show you what happens to you if you don't, if, if you forget to return a value, if you, if you forget the case, what will happen to you? This doesn't compile. This does not compile if you, if you compile this, this fails the Java compilation because the compiler is now able to infer that you've missed one case. So this kind of solves the problem of you forgetting to add a case for an enum somewhere. This does not compile, it's the compiler crashing. So you have to, to insert a Y, you see? So this kind of, uh, it keeps you from forgetting to add a case for a certain switch. You decode what I compile if you switch on an enum and if you return that switch. Java 17, probably this autumn you will get your, your hands on it. I'm, I'm saying 17 because it's long-term supported. 17. Right. Loops. 
what's wrong with loops? So what I want just as a conclusion to the switches, yeah, you could think of polymorphism, but always keep in mind the other alternatives, like a switch expression from Java 17, or uh, keeping references to function in an enum. That's tricky. I have an article on that on D zone if you want to check it out. So there are other ways of avoiding the uh, risk of using repeating repeated switches, right? Loops. What's wrong with loops? <laughs> What's wrong with loops? Now, uh, there is a very contrived and aggressive refactoring in the book, which is called split loop. Now, from one particular perspective, if you think of it, this four is not following a single responsibility principle. Why? Because it's doing two things, A and B. So nowadays, one of a very easy alternative to that is to just do streams two times on that list. Basically splitting the loop into. There are some tricks here. We can, we can talk half an hour about the risks and pros and cons of that. But in 90% of the cases, this works perfectly. So today, having huge loops with lots of stuff inside, it's a, it's a smell. You should break it into smaller sub individual steps, traversing the list many times for each. How about this one? X set param, X do stuff. Uh, do stuff using that parameter. And then the do stuff puts something on this field that you get afterwards. What's that? It's called the temporary field. Instead of passing the one to this method, you are putting this one on a field for this method to take it from the field. What are you doing? Where do you think you are in a secret services movie? You are putting a field somewhere for someone else to take it from there. What the heck is that? Are you, are you hiding yourself? What's the point? So this is called actually, this, that's another code smell uh, stemming from this code, which is, which is named temporal coupling. If you switch the order of these methods, the code will not work anymore. Very, very evil kind of coupling in real projects. So this, to avoid this temporal coupling, the best way is, of course, pass the parameter and get the result back without any fields in between. So temporary fields are a, um, are a, a code smell because you rely on some mutable data which is left there, right? Now, mutable data in itself is not bad either, but it's bad when it lives a long time. When you get a chunk of data with getters and setters, blah, setters, and you move that object through 1,000 lines of code, there will be one place in those 1,000 lines of code that some developer will think, oh, let me just set this field to this value, right? That's where mutable data is terrible. When it traverses lots of lots of code and someone somewhere changes some field and then Guess who, right? It's very, very evil. Right? And if you add multi-threading to this party, you get rest in peace. Right? Multiple threads changing stuff in the same moment. My God, this is just, yeah, no, don't do that. Now, <laughs> I'm not, this image might be too strong, but one thing I believe in is that to defeat evil, you should start by naming it, by finding good names for the things you want to fight. So to, to summarize what we've discussed, we talked about the long methods, more than a screen, or you, you name it. It's just a number. You, you sit down with your team, work out some, some exercises and settle on some ideal function size. I don't like three lines methods either. I like about ten, seven or ten, or 10 lines. Good class, if your class exceeds 300 lines, your build should fail on Jenkins. Your build should fail or a git hook should reject the push. A git hook should reject, I did that for a client of mine. A git hook should reject the push of a Java class larger than 300 lines of code. Data clumps, the strings and ints that move together, long parameter list, not more than three or four. Uh, and this, only if you are quite more into domain driven design, you might think more maybe about that. Data class, feature envy, middleman, they talk to object oriented programming really. Data class is bad because it lacks behavior. Feature envy tells that some logic working heavily on the state of an object should be in that object. And middleman, it's the, the, the misusage of OOP, when you just uh, convey forward the uh, method call to another object. Duplicated code, yeah, it's bad when it changes. Shotgun surgery is a symptom of changing things everywhere. Divergent code is when you are keen against, you're very against copy-pasting and you end up putting booleans, booleans here, right? 
Right, then we have uh, repeated switches and loops, which we can uh, avoid using maybe some functional styles stuff. Temporary field and long lived mutable data are bad because you have to figure out who and when and why change the data. And uh, speculative generality, we, yeah, the building of framework. Don't build a framework, put the production and then think about frameworks. Comments, it's very polemic and we can spend half an hour again talking about good and bad comments. But you can find many, many of those in chapter three in this book. There is also a very user-friendly site that I will show you. There are actually two of them, Refactoring Guru and Source Making Com, I think they are called. And there are, they are all here. There are others like this. What the heck is that, right? Um, there are cases in which you do encounter such code, code smells, but the most interesting from all of these we've covered it already. So that's where the most interesting. Now this was actually the first part of the presentation, the code smells that you will run into and you should detect. And you should make all your colleagues aware of this. All of, all of your team should be fluent in what these mean and should feel that. What must you do? Refactoring. We have to do refactoring. What's that? <laughs> refactoring is simplifying existing code, making it more readable without changing its external behavior. In other words, do not break production. <laughs> Let me play that again. Do not break production when you refactor. When you make your code more readable, do not break production. So what you have to do is to do disciplined refactoring with simple, tiny, safe steps, right? We can, I have two days of training on this regard. I mean, it's easy to learn to change the code fast. And this is typically how the best of the, of the of people start with Tarzan style refactoring, right? changing code everywhere very fast. You have to go through this phase in your evolution as a as a craftsman, as a, as a software professional. But then you realize that you do break things if you move this fast, and that's when you really my typical example. Yeah, this is the switch watchmaker, right? the Swiss watchmaker, who is very careful what he what he does here. You want this guy as a colleague in a real project, not Tarzan. But you have to go through this phase first. You have to love to refactor. And then to refrain yourself and to find those tiny steps that will get you there in a safe, on a safe path. Very tricky in practice to do. There are a sort, a sort of, of techniques, practical techniques in IntelliJ that you can use. I'm planning to do a little uh, talk on that too, of uh, refactoring tools that with IntelliJ, basically, I, I, I am a bit scared, a bit afraid to say that, but with refactoring, you can throw away three quarters of this book with IntelliJ. All those techniques, those fine grained techniques, they are all implemented, most of them automatically as automatic refactorings. You know what, what shocks you most in this book, really? The moment you read the, you, you get to the code and you see that this is JavaScript. My friends, Martin Farrer wanted to, to make a proof of strength. He said, I am this strong that I can refactor JavaScript. I can refactor JavaScript and you can't refactor Java with IntelliJ, really, right? So this, he proves that you can refactor JavaScript. Although refactoring is not very typical to JavaScript code, but still, you have no excuse not doing refactoring with, with a tool like IntelliJ. Still, there are many things stopping us from refactoring. And this is the focus of the second part of this talk. First of all, of course, is fear. Being afraid to break something. Fear is good, but you have to control fear. You shouldn't be terrified of the code. You shouldn't be afraid of the thing that you created. You shouldn't be afraid of the code that you're seeing in front of you. But you run into this scenario that people say, I, I ask this question, what stops us from refactoring to thousands of developers? Practically, so effectively, thousands of developers. And the, the, among the first two answers, there is always fear. I'm afraid not to break things. And I keep pushing. Tell me more. So I'm afraid to refactor because I, we don't have tests to cover our ass because you might break something. And then I, of course, I ask them, why don't you build tests? And the answer is always because I can't test a 200 lines method. It is impossible to test a function of 200 lines. It is impossible. You will need probably seven mocks. Please don't do that to yourself. Don't try to do that. So that, that this is basically what we call the vicious circle of legacy code. This is the definition of legacy code. If you are in this scenario, you are in legacy code. By the way, you can be on your own project that you started two years ago. I don't care. It's still legacy if you are in this vicious circle. This, it is, in my opinion, defines the feeling of, uh, of legacy code. Now, 
uh, it's very tricky to break this uh, this vicious circle because I understand you are afraid. It's normal to be afraid. You don't want to break production. However, there are some ways to work around that. Um, I will get to that, but in simple words, the best should be one, one way is to practice until you are confident in the steps that you're taking and you are 99% safe, sure that you don't break things. Then there is pair programming. Pair programming has been proven to lower less 80% bugs. 80% less bugs if you do pair programming, according to the to a study on c2.com. And TDD, TDD by itself will not, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't mean here to practice TDD uh, religiously on your, on your production code. Maybe if you are strong enough and you have a good team, maybe, maybe. In Romania, this is impossible. And at least in the Eastern Europe, very rarely I find the clients where they are practicing TDD every day. However, practicing TDD, trying TDD will get your mind into a state that you will detect the bugs that you're introducing as you type them. You will get to a point in which as you start to type some, 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 some logic, the bells will start ringing in your head because you've seen a test failing for that kind of change in the TDD that you've done those 1000 hours before. So TDD is not necessarily, oh yeah, indeed, it will build yourself a bulletproof uni, uh, unit test suit, but it will more importantly sharpen your skills so you get more attentive to details. And you get to a stage in which, as, as uh, J Brains puts it, you, want, you don't need tests that much because you are so good in those micro steps that you're taking that tests, yeah, they are cool, but you don't necessarily need them because so in my refactoring training today, I take production codes from my clients, from my from the teams that join my training, and I live refactor in front of them. I never do a mistake anymore. Never. Never. So sometimes I do a, a mistake intentionally to see if they get it, like early returning before another line. So short, basically skipping that line because of the return. So I got to do this, this stage in, the, in that I never introduce bugs. So I, at least I am 100% aware when things are risky. So I know my limits. I know where are the places in which I might introduce bugs. And in those places, I will build tests. But again, Jay Brain says the same thing, but he practiced TDD for 15 freaking years, 15 years of TDD. We don't do that much. All right. So besides fear, what else does stop us? Time, of course. We don't have time. I don't have time. I'm too busy. I have too much to do. I have to ship. I have, this is, this is most, this is usually the first reason. I don't have time. Folks, did you know that you've ever heard that being busy is a form of laziness? Brilliant talk by Tim Ferriss. Being busy is a form of laziness, means that you didn't took time, enough time to automate and to reflect of what, on what you're doing. So my advice, if you think that you're too busy, is to do less by automating steps like scripts, bash scripts, Python scripts, whatever you want, make them fast and do your stuff. And always stop and reflect on how you're working. Right? Uh, this is a good link for you to watch this video afterwards. I will share my slides with your community leads and they will share with you uh, too. Then improve your focus. Now, from a human perspective, you should be more focused. You can, you can read about the seven habits of successful people, the Pomodoro technique. You shouldn't check your inbox very carefully in the morning. Use that time for the time of high focus before lunch. Uh, have the meetings shorter than 40 minutes. Uh, use the siesta time to do boring stuff like emails. Uh, uh, schedule your activities throughout the day so that you can make best use of your focus. And then again, from Jay Brains, from other talk. Actually, that was not from Jay Brains. It was from another one. Jay Brains in this his talk says that after you finish a task, <laughs> pay attention. After you finish a task, spend thirty minutes trying to improve your design. Yeah, I know you don't have time. You're too busy. I know. Do that. What? What would you? What are? What are not thinking? I say. What? But what would my boss say? <laughs> the reality is. Folks, I did it myself before listening to Jay Brains. I did it myself without knowing. I spent more time after finishing a task. No one ever said to me that I am not doing my work. Never. What, what Jay Brains says in the following, in this talk says, okay, if no one claims, no one complains, do one hour after two weeks. Then if no one still complains, do two hours. 
after finishing a task. What the heck is that? What do you mean? After finishing a task, spend some more time to improve the design, to put some more test cases in place, to make design more simple, to make more methods more expressive, to rename a variable. To spend some time on that. This will also give you time to practice and sharpen your skills and also improve the design for the next poor soul who will have to read your code. So do that as a simple trick to get time. After you finish a task, spend some more time. Right? But even if you do that, yeah, okay, even if you do that, we still can get things wrong. When they ask us for estimates, <laughs> they ask us for estimates and we throw an estimate. <laughs> My friend, this is not close to reality. This is more close to reality. You love your project, but you still throw estimates blindly. This is still not close enough to reality. This is the reality. When the project <laughs> changes the requirements, spin every week, every three weeks, every month, the business changes their mind and so on. This is the reality and he is blindfolded. And you are throwing estimates <laughs> at yourself, basically, at your project. So my point with estimates is, um, first of all, uh, don't rush when you are asked to, to do estimates. Many people, you know, that was a famous quote, um, um, instead of uh, 30 minutes uh, meeting, planning by basically better two weeks or something like that two weeks of coding it was the same as code. i'm not sure if i uh, it was a weeks of coding can save you hours of planning yeah developers are famously reluctant to meetings and i understand that i, I give that it's true after 30 minutes your attention span drops to zero and you're just sitting there doing nothing fortunately in these COVID times you can put you can plug in some ears and do the dishes <laughs> yeah who cares right but the point is that weeks of coding people want to code and still they are they are forced to go into meetings to provide estimates yeah and they will rush to do that if you rush when you estimate then you're screwed. Right? Your estimates should be as precise as possible. And you should, they should always include the cleanup and like, I mean, refactoring and unit testing. Never estimate just the development, of course. You estimate as a whole, refactoring plus testing plus development equals X. This is the figure. Now, one key thing I learned from my experience is that you should be hunting for an old developer on that project. He is not in your company anymore go google him to hunt him on linkedin on twitter offer him a beer ask him about the things which he knew that were tricky in that project they, sometimes I mean, people came to me I, I led seven projects at ibm before i left and uh, the, the people came to me and asked me uh, victor can you help me i'm trying to do this change what's the danger you know? and sometimes it happened that when i heard he wanted to change that class that i knew it was creepy I warned him, please multiply your, pay, pay attention, pay attention. This has repercussion, it has impact there, there, there and there. So sometimes uh, just a word from an old developer on that code base can uh, multiply your estimates by a, by a huge factor. Oh, and this brings me to the shit factor. Have you ever heard of the shit factor? Uh, uh, the, the project manager call it the contingency factor. It's the thing that you put uh, extra on the estimates just because you know that you're touching that old creepy class that you are afraid of or that is very, very, yeah, bad somehow. Now, you probably already, probably you are, if you're in, in an agile team, we are using velocity. Maybe you're estimating in function points. Fair, fair enough. No matter how he estimates on how you really work, I want you to measure your actual consumed time. For me as a project lead, it was very hard to do that. I, I, know, I don't know what, from a psychological point of view, I don't like to be shown how far I was from reality, how, how bad I was at estimates. But you as a developer, as a tech lead, not a project manager, the tech lead, you should measure how far your estimates were from what your actual was, from what you estimated. And then you learn this shit factor. Now, this shit factor is basically, how do you use this shit factor? <laughs> I will stop saying this one. How do you use this factor? Um, um, 
whenever you want to touch this class, uh, 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 the thing that you, so you estimate two days, right? And this class has a sheet factor of three. You provide then six days of estimates. <laughs> it's not that easy. Right? The amount of time that you think it will take you, you multiply by, by this factor. Now, the fun fact is that this can be specific to code area. For that class, it's terrible. For those other classes, it's fine. It's, you don't need to multiply by three, just by two. I don't know. The average factor was 2.5 in my project. But you know how I do it? I, I ask people to estimate together what's the amount of time they think it will take it to do if they won't use any Facebook, Google, and Stack Overflow, if they would just be coding. And then multiply that by 2.5. Find your own number, measure it compared to what uh, happened in the past. Now, I will dare to quote a bit Uncle Bob on this one. Um, um, Uncle Bob uh, has this talk, I think it's called The Future of Programming or something like that. Or if I will be your next project manager, I, there will be a link somewhere. Basically, he says the following. If you are asked to provide a single number as an estimate, then your managers actually try to put you to assume the risk. Now, we are not some prophets to know how much time we will spend there. So what Uncle Bob goes, and says, goes ahead and says, it says, don't provide them a single number. Give them a distribution, a probability distribution. Tell them mean expected worth. Have, give them triplets. Your manager, when they will see that, they have two options. Three options. First option is scream. Because, uh, yeah, what the heck is that? What do you mean five? I will pick to so, scream. They won't expect this of you. Two, use this and be, try to play nice with that and try to uh, compute some overall risks for that project. They won't ever do that. And three, the sad reality, if you ever say the manager this, they will take two. <laughs> they will just take two blindly and they will say, yeah, we'll just use two. If you see them doing that, don't give two, three, or five. Give them a number on this slope between the uh, the expected and the worst. In this, in my case, four. But we need to have time to refactor. We need to have time to test. We need to have time to clean up the garbage that we are pouring every day in code. Oh, and then do you know what, 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 would, what would happen? They will come to you and ask you, could you please try? <laughs> could you at least try to do it in two days? And Uncle Bob is, is incredible on this one. He says, how dare you, son of a son on the beach? I don't, I don't know if you, if you know this video. Son on the beach. beach. The Italian men. Oh, no, that is not this one. The Italian when The Italian men who went to Malta. You son on the beach, how dare you? How dare you suggest that I am not trying right now? How dare you suggest that I should try? I'm trying already. You can't just say that to your manager, but you can say a very sharp, no, I am trying. No, I can't. Because if, you're, if you say, okay, I will try, they will, they will understand this as a confirmation. They will understand that you promised them to, to, to finish in two days. So don't fall in this trap of, oh, yeah, I will try. No, 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 you won't try. This is the reality, right? But sometimes it might happen to you that you really don't know to what to say, right? It might be a very technical, challenging, like the first time you use Kafka, for example, or the first time you deploy microservices. You just you really don't know how hard it will be from a technical point of view. The best thing you could do then is to ask for two or three days um, uh, of, um, of work uh, to do a little proof of concept, and then you will come back with a more accurate estimate. So uh, ask to do prototypes, and they, you might have success. They might actually grant you that time. So ask for two weeks, several days of experimentation before you commit to some estimate. Now, if the functionality of the thing that you want to implement is very complex, and now, my friend, that's the point of Agile. You should break down those tasks into smaller, fine-grained tasks and iterate on that. Right. But yeah, keep this in mind. And if you are here, please don't, don't do that. 
just say no, no, <laughs> let's think again. Let's do that on the or that. Don't don't try both. Right. So this these are the most criminal stoppers, deadlines. And we've discussed about the idea of exposing the risk, the shit factor, and the and being strong in our opinion. We say no, that's it. Okay. Then, uh, at least in my part of Europe, and I don't expect in Switzerland it's very common practice, but you might have this in if you outsource stuff. In Romania, and in many countries I've seen also. In, even if I tell my developers that they have, that they should do their best and not rush, some developers have this type of personality that they want somehow to impress me, let's say. And they come back after just several hours or half a day telling me that they finished the job. Even if I estimated that to take at least two days, right? And when this happens to me, I will ask typically them, my friend, is it worth it to be, are you proud of your work? Should you should we put that as a sample of your code to your resume? Right? I mean, challenge them, ask your developers to do their best because you are not always rushing to meet a deadline. You will have some relaxed time every now and then. If this happens to you, do not run, do your best. Do your best. Be proud of your work. Fear of bugs, I told you. The typical solutions are, of course, nothing competes a strong set of unit tests. But however, oftentimes you don't have these. So then use pre programming or even rely on a heavy practice to make sure to, to grow in, to know the, your weaknesses and to know when you will introduce bugs. You will get to some point in which, even if you have a method of 200 lines, you will be certain that you can use extract methods to break it into smaller methods and then break it into several classes, 100% safe. We can do this with IntelliJ. Merge conflicts, that's brilliant. So imagine you are on a branch, long lived branch for two months, for example, and you get an idea of to improve your code. And you say, oh, the code will look way easier, way simpler if I would just do this refactoring stuff. But trust me, you will not do that refactoring. Why? Because you know that then there will be merge conflicts. And very few things are more frustrating than merge conflicts. Namely, the most frustrating things in developers' life were interruptions. That's why people today don't want to get back to work. COVID helped us in this regard. You just mute your Slack, turn off your phone, and you get your, 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 your Zen garden for 40 minutes, right? Then there were merge conflicts. Then there was refactoring tests. This is very frustrating activity, right? What about if we distinguish artificial project deadlines and external deadlines? Ha! Ha, Peter, you're touching on a thing here on a very sensitive aspect, really. It's a human aspect. Some people work better under stress. Some people, some personality types, perform better if they are told they should ship in five days. And then you, as a tech lead, know that your deadline is in seven days, not five days. So that's what you mean here by artificial project deadlines versus external deadlines. The seven days is the external deadline. You have to put the production in seven days. But you might, in some cases, I'm not happy with that, but in some cases you might communicate to the team that you only have five days to meet the deadline. I'm not happy with that. Uh, then you have a team which is not as mature as I would like to have. But for some teams, it's the only way. That's the reality. You have to lead also. Merge conflicts, however, to come back to my point, it will, will stop us from refactoring, right? The alternative of that is basically what we call trunk-based development. The best companies out there do that. Facebook, Google does that. They deploy a feature under a feature toggle and they put the production, this thing, with the toggle set to false. It's insane. This feature is not yet ready, right? It requires a very mature team and a very disciplined way of working but it's the best thing you can do if you want to do a deep refactoring on a brand. We did that several times, not always. We also had feature branches, don't get me wrong. But there were times in which some performance tuning that we wanted to do, we saw that it will heavily impact 
production. So we chose to do this feature toggle stuff and not branch and worked on that single trunk, let's say for, I don't know, two months, slowly, progressively refactoring and put into production. One thing that will hit you here is uh, increment. You have to have incremental database migrations. This is a, 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 a really tricky thing if you want to try that. So this is a link here. Read about this trunk based development. Now, this is another thing which stops refactoring, right? Merge conflicts. So we, the solution will have will be to have short lived branches or even try trunk based development. If you have a mature team, maybe, I don't know, three or five plus years of experience and very focused and dedicated team. Fear of breaking your legs. Now, folks, I, I'm, this might be a too hard, too tough expression, but let me put it in in in, a, in an example. You will, I mean, the quality of the code decreases over time. This is not something that happens to some project. This is just the second law of thermodynamics, my friends. The second law of thermodynamics says that the entropy of a the entropy of a, of a of universe increases to infinitum. Entropy equals chaos. Our pro the, the chaos in our code base is growing, is, is, is always growing. So the code quality always decreases. But there will be a point in life in which you will say, my God, uh, you see that this new feature that you will have to put in the code will make a terrible mess out of your code. You know that your, your code quality will go like this very soon. And then and you, you f are facing this deep refactoring. If you're practicing domain-driven design, this might be a, a that moment of the domain refactoring, a deep uh, insight in the domain. You need to crack your entity model, actually. If this happens to you, you are facing a very complex refactoring, a very complex refactoring. Now, the bad news in here is that the first step towards refactoring will be to make a bigger mess than it is right now. As an example, join two huge methods into a humongous one. Why? Just to have a clear picture of the garbage before you extract it and you, and you reshape it in a different structure. So you have to have to break some eggs to make an omelet and people are afraid of that. People are literally afraid of the 600 lines method. I know, I know, I felt that. But you have to have faith that you will end, that you will get to the other side, and not only faith in your refactoring skills and in your insight, but you always have to be prepared that in case you don't recover after one day of work, you need to be prepared to revert to undo your work for two freaking days, and you will cry, you will scream, you will, you will like, ah, God damn it. We're throwing away the work for two days, it's insane, right? But that, so basically, throwing yourself down the hole here requires the strength to revert after your time box is done and also the speed to get somewhere. Imagine a junior working for five days to split the class and break the tests and imagine the pain he will go through after five days of work to throw his work because he didn't get anything better, right? I don't want you to spend five days and be emotionally involved with weird refactoring. I want to try. I want to explore. And I want to, you to be fast and to draw some conclusions as fast as possible. And this is very tricky, basically, in real projects. Such a deep refactoring will typically require exploration. It will require you to take a ride and to see what you need to change exploratory refactoring, time box session, 15, 30 minutes, break a class, see what happens. Break that system in two little modules, see what happens. Maybe it takes four, four hours, two hours, no matter what you do, be, be committed to undo at the end, right? Don't try to push it, explore. The, whenever you face a deep refactoring, those refactoring that will really clean up your, your design, it's very often, that uh, the first thing you do, you do a bigger mess. I've done it many times in my career. It's very frustrating. You get to scream there. If you throw yourself that hole without, without pair programming, you are very depressed. So I'm talking about uh, those refactorings which change more than 50 classes, that kind of refactoring, deep refactoring. Some people will argue this is not a refactor, this is a redesign. Yeah, that kind of stuff. 
lack of long term vision. I will take four, five more minutes just to be clear. It's sharp, it's sharp now. Just to. lack of long term vision. People don't know what they are supposed to go to. Okay, we are in the legacy code. What do we want to get? We want to decouple that part of the system, not those other parts. That part. Kick that part every time you can. Right? Have a committed team towards this common goal. Unknown code. But you know, people tell me, oh, I can't refactor because I don't know the code. But you know what happens? It happens very often that uh, uh, when you refactor, you get more ideas of refactoring. Isn't it so? When you refactor, you get more ideas. Let me refactor this too. Why, why does this happen? Because you learn more from the code. Because refactoring is the learning activity. The thing that you put your hands on, you remember way much better than the vase that you just admired at the museum. But stop reading code with your hands at the back tied up with some handcuffs. No, the best way to understand code is by putting your hands in there, trying to rename this method, extract that thing. This is the best way to learn the code. And that's why I don't believe in this stopper because you should start refactoring and you, see, you will see that you will get to learn the code better and better as you shape it slowly, right? Lack of skills. I don't think there are any of you who doesn't know how to extract the method really. But you do, now, you do have to make those code smells that we've covered aware for your entire team. You should all have this very fluent in your language. Right, then uh, explicitly, for, yeah, this won't happen to you, but will. Uh, some people just don't want to do a good job. Some people just don't care. I will call them the YOLO driven developers. I'm not sure if you, remember, if you know this development methodology, YOLO driven development. Like uh, um, I don't always test my code, but when I do, I do it in production, right? Uh, don't indent. A real men deploy with FTP. What the heck, right? This is the kind of guy who just wants to, yeah, it's nine to five. I want to get home. Give me a break. I don't give a shit. Right? If this happens to you, this, there are, you have two options. Or you either make refactoring fun and you infect him with this desire of refactoring because it is, an, it is addictive. Refactoring is addictive. And the second, the, the, the second option is to <laughs> provide him the legacy experience, assign him on a, on a bug, which is unfixed for two years. That kind of stuff, right? Uh, make him taste what it means to be from what, what we call a, a non-refactored code, right? Now, folks, this was my, my presentation. It's not very, very, well, let's say. So again, what stops refactoring? Time, fear. Not, not, only, not only fear of bugs, but fear of things you don't know. You learn it as a refactor. Merge conflicts don't have branches, feature branches longer than several days or maybe a week at most. The guts to throw yourself in a large refactor, knowing that you will, might get on the other side or the strength to revert. Team design brainstorm to see what, towards what goal you, you, you push. The will to play and to exercise. And uh, these are the things which I saw that stop most people. And I would like to run a quick poll. I forgot to do that. I will start the poll now for you. You should see a poll right now. And in the meantime, I will ask the questions. So knowing it's seven days, Peter comes back and that example is seven days, the external deadline and five days, my internal deadline that I communicate to my team. Yeah, indeed. You will be accused of not being transparent. Yes, indeed. But you also say diamonds are made under pressure. So indeed, you have to put some pressure on some people. How to, let's see what you mean with here. I mean, number two, extended uh, conference day or it's my shopping day. Uh, yeah, I mean, number two, extended shopping starts in, you could impose some, some internal deadlines. Oh, but I mean, be, be transparent and tell them that they should, they, the project deadline is in seven days, but still, plan some team building, for example, two days before the deadline, so that they will have, they'll be motivated to finish earlier. Yeah, that's that's a good one. So play nice, don't, don't hide stuff. How does this correspond to the small refactoring steps? Indeed, indeed. Probably you, you thought of that when I, I talked about large scale refactoring, Andreas, right? You are right. 
It's not the classical refactoring, although even the most complex refactoring you can do with some fine grain steps. There are some exceptions. But I'm talking now about a different kind of refactoring, not the technical refactoring to make, to fix a code smell. I'm talking about a more large scale refactoring to reshape your entity model, to introduce a new concept in your entity, in your language, a more, uh, how to put, it's not sub, more elaborate refactoring, if you want. Fear, refactoring things outside the initial perimeter. Yes, you might be actually forbidden to touch code outside your scope of your, of your change. And this is very unfortunate. This is very unfortunate. Um, it typically means distrust. I didn't expect that this will happen in Switzerland, but they, you might be in this setup sometimes that, people, that your I don't know, managers, your clients don't trust you anymore and they will explicitly forbid you to touch any code that you aren't directly supposed to change. Very bad if this happens to you. You should seek redemption, regain their trust so that they see your, they see you, the developer, as their partners, not as their workers or their slaves. I mean here, right? you want to be a partner of your business, folks. That's I think I've answered the questions. The link with the presentation I will share with the call with, with your with your community leads. You will have the slides and the recording. Don't don't worry. It's just that it won't be available for, as a search on YouTube. That's that's the only thing. But the recording you will get. Promise. I am done with my uh, presentation. If you have other ideas, please, please uh, share. Oh, I will join the, this other. Yeah, Victor, you can join uh, the Wonder Me session with us. Everyone will now be redirected to it. Um, and uh, we will leave this big marker area here and move on to Wonder Me and can have a chat with each other. So. Thank you very much for listening and see you right right now in the Wonder Me session. Bye bye.